coming up on Market to Market. The Agriculture Department's quarterly stocks and prospective plantings report fuel rallies and sell-offs in the commodity markets. People will come, Ray. People will most definitely come. And 25 years after one farmer built a ballpark in the middle of a cornfield, people still come to the Field of Dreams. Hey, is this heaven? No. It's Iowa. Those stories and market analysis with Brian Roach, next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, April 3 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. Government reports this week revealed demand for U.S. manufactured goods improved as the nation emerged from winter. According to the Commerce Department, factory orders rose two-tenths of a percent in February, snapping a six-month losing streak. Excluding the volatile transportation sector, factory orders increased eight-tenths of a percent in their best performance since June. And U.S. factories have added jobs for 19 straight months in the longest hiring streak since the mid-1990s. Meanwhile, America's massive trade deficit narrowed in February, despite falling U.S. exports. And that's because the plunge was outpaced by an even steeper decline in imports, due primarily to cheaper oil prices. America also is importing less crude due to surging domestic production. But the oil boom is not without drawbacks. Critics blame advanced drilling techniques for everything from environmental degradation to railroad disasters. This week, state government and the railways themselves responded to the charges. One of the states that has benefited the most from hydraulic fracturing, or fracking, is joining a lawsuit against the federal government over a new federal rule involving the disclosure of chemicals used in the process. North Dakota officially joined Wyoming this week in a case against the Bureau of Land Management. Last month, the Obama administration announced it will require companies drilling on federal lands to disclose the chemicals used in the fracking process. Wyoming and North Dakota officials say the mandate is unlawful because it interferes with state laws regulating the industry. Producing more than one million barrels of oil per day last year, North Dakota trails only Texas in oil production. Moving all of that crude from the Bakken region has been done primarily by rail. And that too faces increased scrutiny over safety procedures. Late this week, the dominant carrier in the Bakken, BNSF, announced changes to crude oil trains in the wake of four high-profile derailments in the U.S. and Canada. The Texas-based company now will require trains carrying crude oil to slow to 35 miles per hour in cities with more than 100,000 people. BNSF also will increase track inspections near waterways and look for defective wheels to replace before they can cause derailments. The number of rail accidents remains low compared to the total number of shipments. But fiery accidents involving crude are increasing as production in the U.S. and Canada is also rising. Railroads hauled 493,126 tank cars of crude in 2014, up almost 21 percent from a year before and up 5,000 percent from when the boom began in 2008. BNSF officials say they will now inspect the track two and a half times more often than regulations require, and the railroad has already doubled the frequency near waterways. 
While most sports fans are probably more focused on the Final Four this weekend, the Boys of Summer begin their regular season Sunday when the St. Louis Cardinals take on the Chicago Cubs. The infamous Black Sox, however, are out of the picture this year as they have been since 1919. And shoeless Joe Jackson is nowhere to be found, yet anything but forgotten in Iowa. Jackson, whose legacy was tarnished in a cheating scandal nearly a century ago, was the inspiration for a 1989 film featuring an enchanted cornfield in the Hawkeye State. And as Paul Yeager explains, thousands of fans still make the pilgrimage to the Field of Dreams to celebrate the values of baseball and the virtues of relationships. Hey, is this heaven? No. It's Iowa. 25 years ago, the movie Field of Dreams lit up the big screen. But when the film premiered in 1989, little did people know that the kind of attention it would attract. Field of Dreams is one of the most iconic baseball movies, but more than that, it's probably one of the most iconic films of its generation. You know, some films are critically acclaimed, and it was nominated for an Academy Award as Best Picture that year. But then there are also films that just kind of continue to resonate. They stay with people. And if you are someone who gets it, and this is one of these films, either you get it or you don't, but millions of people really got it, it's one that kind of stays with you. Field of Dreams seems to resonate with people near and far. And fans come from all corners of the world to visit the location. Last July, thousands gathered at the site to celebrate its 25th anniversary. And there's just something about this ball diamond chiseled out of a cornfield that draws people to the tiny town of Dyersville, Iowa. I have great feelings about Iowa. We've written, my band has written a couple songs that invoke the name Iowa. Uh, so it's marked me. Uh, it's a part of my history. Um, and uh, I think this movie, the movie we made, Field of Dreams, 25 years later, it still gathers people from around the world to come be at this simple little field, and, and, and we'll, we again celebrate that 25 years after the fact. In the film, Costner's character, Ray Kinsella, plows his cornfield under to build, of all things, a baseball diamond. Kinsella's motivation to destroy his share of Iowa's dominant cash crop was rooted in the prophecy, if you build it, he will come. The movie transcends baseball by highlighting a son's simple desire to reunite with his late father and emotion experienced by millions of people every year. This was a film about redemption. It was a film about uh, the unspoken word, how communication between fathers and sons and mothers and daughters can occur, not just with a written word, but also in terms of just having a catch or just in terms of their uh, body language and their eye contact. So I think it's, it's a film that really covers a lot of ground and it, uh, it really comes back to what Terrence Mann said in the movie about baseball is where you can go back when things aren't really going well in your life or in the world, baseball kind of brings things back to normal. And I think that's why the American public is so enthralled with this movie is because it kind of brings things back to normal and we can think about what's good about our country and about ourselves and about our relationships. The one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. America has ruled by like an army of steamrollers. It's been erased like a blackboard, rebuilt and erased again. But baseball has marked the time. This field, this game, is a part of our past, Ray. It reminds us of all that once was good, and it could be again. The 25th anniversary celebration included a baseball game by the Ghost Players, a group of former professional and semi-professional athletes, including some who appeared in the movie. I was an extra, so most of the time I'd just stand around or I was sitting <laughs> down or else, but I was lucky enough that I was, I was pitching at that time when Tim Busfield walk, drives down the lane and he doesn't really get to see us yet and there else, and he's so nervous that I'm gonna hit him, and then, <laughs> Well, Don Buford was in charge of us, and he, he 
come out and he says, well, I said, be more, more normal if Hank would say, look out. So I did. And all of a sudden, next morning, I was on the Screen Actors Guild. So that was kind of neat. When Universal Studios filmed Field of Dreams during the summer of 1988, the movie was shot almost exclusively in Iowa. While drought that year wreaked havoc on the production, the Field of Dreams became an iconic shrine for fans of the film, and Iowa took on special meaning for those involved in the production. Iowa is Iowa, and it's irreplaceable. I mean, it, there's, there's no place else like it. I mean, there's something very unusual about, about the just honest ethic of, of being involved with people here. It's real. It's like I said, the handshake deal. It's like people just open their hearts and open their doors to you. They respect you. There's a great thing about, about good old-fashioned American re respect that exists right here in Iowa. It's a very, very true thing. I grew up on a farm in Ohio, so being in Iowa just felt like home to me. Uh, I mean, the rolling hills, and I mean, just so beautiful. I mean, those of you who live here know, and those of us who have visited here know. Uh, so it, it just felt like home to me, and the people are so nice and so you know, supportive, you know, everywhere we go, there'd be people, well, what can I get for you? Can I, can I do something for you, you know? And, and uh, it's been by far the most uh, rewarding experience I've had in film. I got a little knot in my stomach when I came around the corner and I saw it. I lived here with, with a different mind and what it means to people now and how people come and travel and make pilgrimages here and what they experience within their families, especially, and how this film has resonated within families and and affected so many men and so many women that realized that it affected the, the husband and the man and seeing daughters and, uh, that have lost their father come and want to feel him here. This movie does that really beautifully. Maintained as a tourist attraction since the filming of the movie, the Field of Dreams was recently sold. But the developers' plans for the iconic site are dividing some of the community's landowners. Go the Distance Baseball plans to build a $70 million, 24-field mega sports complex on the 193-acre farm. In opposition, there is a Save the Field of Dreams initiative on Facebook, a coalition of neighboring farmers known as the Residential and Agricultural Advisory Committee. It sued the city of Dyersville, alleging that its rezoning of the Field of Dreams from agricultural to commercial ground is illegal. The case awaits a judge's ruling. You want to have a catch? I'd like that. Regardless of the outcome, 2014 will be remembered as a celebration of the movie Field of Dreams, its pastoral location, and the impact both have had on hundreds of thousands of fans over the past 25 years. For Market to Market, I'm Paul Yeager. Next, the Market to Market Report. Facing their fourth consecutive year of drought, officials may want to change California's nickname to the Brown State. With the smallest Sierra Nevada snowpack in 65 years of record keeping as a backdrop, Governor Jerry Brown this week ordered cities and towns to cut water use by 25 percent. Some businesses, like car washes, must cut their water use significantly. And local governments will tear out 50 million square feet of lawns to be replaced with drought-tolerant plants. Critics blasted the Democratic governor's orders because they contain no mandatory reductions for agriculture, which is by far California's largest consumer of water. Further east in the Corn Belt, conditions are much more favorable. And as planters begin to roll in some areas this week, the government bean counters released their much-anticipated quarterly stocks and prospective plantings reports. According to the Agriculture Department, U.S. producers are expected to plant 89.2 million acres of corn this spring. If realized, that would be down 2% from last year and the smallest corn acreage since 2010. Soybean plantings, on the other hand, are predicted to increase by 1% to 84.6 million acres. That would be an all-time high for the oil seeds, but it's still less than analysts had predicted. Wheat acreage is forecast at 55.4 million, representing a 3% decline from last year. 13 million acres are expected to be sown in spring wheat, down slightly from March of 2014, 
while winter wheat planting is expected to rise 1% to 40.8 million acres. But the big story this week was found in the government's quarterly stocks estimates. USDA pegged corn in all positions at 7.7 .7 billion bushels. That's up 11% from last year, and 57% of that grain is stored on the farm. Soybean stockpiles are estimated at 1.3 billion bushels, up 34% from last year, and farmers are holding 609 million bushels, reflecting an increase of 60% from last March. Wheat supplies are pegged at 1.12 billion bushels, up slightly from this time last year, and on-farm stockpiles rose 17% to 279 million bushels. On balance, the reports were viewed as bullish for soybeans, bearish for corn, and neutral for wheat. And the markets behaved pretty much as expected, with soybeans moving higher immediately after the report, while corn and wheat headed south. But by the end of trading Thursday, grain prices recovered all of those losses due largely to a rapidly weakening dollar. The trade's attention now turns to Mother Nature. Any weather-related disruption in planting could be the next factor in market equations, though analysts acknowledge it will take severe weather issues to move prices significantly higher. Commodity markets were closed late this week for Good Friday. But in four days of trading, wheat recovered all of last week's losses and then some. For the week, May wheat gained nearly 30 cents, while a nearby corn contract moved 5 cents lower. Soybeans rallied in the wake of this week's reports as the May contract advanced by 19 cents. Nearby meal prices followed suit with an upward move of nearly $6 per ton. In the softs, cotton extended its winning streak as the May contract gained 14 cents per hundredweight. Dairy prices also improved modestly as April Class 3 milk futures rose 6 cents. Livestock prices were mixed as the June cattle contract gained 39 cents. Nearby feeders were off 68 cents and the June lean hog contract gained 17 cents. In the currency market, the U.S. dollar index proved to be volatile again and capped off an abbreviated trading week with a gain of 153 basis points. Crude oil rose 27 cents per barrel. Comex Gold advanced by 20 cents per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index lost just over one point to settle at 480. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is a newcomer to the program, Brian Roach. Brian, welcome to Market to Market. Thanks, Mike. We're excited to have you. We're excited to have you this week. A lot going on. Let's jump right into this wheat market, which had a good run. Talk to us about where this is heading. Well, on Tuesday's report, the uh, Stocks and Planning Intentions report didn't really give us any surprises there. Very much a neutral report. What's really driving the wheat market right now is weather concerns about uh, winter kill and how much precipitation we're going to get over this kind of, this is a very important part of the winter wheat uh, growing season as we come out of uh, winter and, and look at emergence. There'd be a lot of concern about the two-week forecast being very dry. Uh, I looked at the 11 to 15 day models and it just looks like persistently dry. Kansas, big parts of Oklahoma are not seeing the precipitation that you really need. And so when the, when the market's set up like this, uh, we look at the short-sided specs as being very, very, uh, they're prone to have to short cover for the market to go higher. And so I think the wheat market combined with a, a, a dollar that kind of weakened this week, we ended the, the dollar ended lower today, and I think that's a little bit of a tailwind. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be encouraging our producers to sell on our roach sell signals probably uh, early next week if we maintain this momentum here. I think wheat producers ought to be taking some risk off the table on, on crops in the bin and also some, some new crops. All right, so a little something to look forward to on the, on the, for the producers out there. Yeah, I think wheat's a positive right now. All right, now that being said, you mentioned we're getting into those concerns of, of winter kill, of the expansion of the drought, or perhaps the worsening of the drought. And that leads us into our question here from one of our followers on Twitter. You can find us at Market to Market on Twitter, and you can find us on Facebook. Please follow. Andy in Gothenburg, Nebraska is curious. How much wheat is going to come out of production from winter kill and drought, and do we think that'll shift into corn or will it go fallow? Well, it depends on prices, and I think it also depends on just how bad this weather, uh, this dry weather pattern were to pers persist. Uh, I think that uh, it's still just a little bit too early here. In the next couple weeks, we'll start to get a better read on winter kill. 
Uh, depending on where, where prices are in beans, uh, my thought is that some of that will actually go to, to beans more easily, more readily. It gives you a little bit more waiting time, perhaps. Uh, and then maybe corn if that doesn't look like a good opportunity. All right, so now let's talk about the corn market. We got a little bit of a shock to the market on Tuesday, yes. and we saw both old and new crop take pretty big tumbles. Talk old crop first. Did this fall into a buy signal for you guys at, at Roach Ag? Uh, not quite, because you know the 18 cents that we lost on Tuesday on a bearish stocks number, uh, you know, the stocks number was 140 million bushels or so larger than expected. That translates into a question about feed numbers and feed and residual numbers. Uh, but by the end of the week, I mean, you know, we gained back 11 cents of that 18, and we're right back into the sideways range that we've been in, that 25 cent range. So, uh, my way of looking at it is that farmers aren't really willing to sell at those lower prices. Uh, the dollar was a little bit of a tailwind to help corn prices back, but I think. You know, we needed a catalyst going into Tuesday's report for old crop corn, and we didn't get it. So I think what producers are going to want to look at here is we get to the top side of that range, look at, at our, our roach sell signals have been good triggers to take some risk out of the, off the table, out of the bin, and, and you want to continue to do that and look for basis opportunities and continue to do that. All right, now on the new crop side, a lot of producers have been holding off, making sales, waiting for that spring rally. In your mind, is that still coming? I think there's still lots of opportunity to price new crop ahead of us. The stocks adjustment uh, in old crop uh, really draws a question to, it, it creates a more of a buffer for yields, yield performance this year. We had a record yield last year. The idea that we back it up with another record yield, I think, is a really big question. Corn acres were larger than expected. That that actually brought corn, corn prices down to four, back down to that four dollar number. But I don't think four dollars brings corn into production where final uh, planting decisions uh, lie. Still, so. Uh, my way of thinking is that these kind of corn prices uh, versus the rise we saw in bean prices, we really don't know what that corn number is going to be. It wouldn't surprise me that the corn number backs off from the 89.2 and that bean numbers actually increase. And now let's talk about soybeans. We did get uh, the, a little bit lower acreage number than a lot of analysts were expecting. Again, did this give us a, a selling opportunity on that old crop soybean? Uh, you know, we're looking, we, uh, the bean market put a low in uh, just over $9 in the fall. And uh, Tuesday's report actually gave us another bottom to that. And what I'd like to see is a confirmation of a double bottom in the bean market. And, and I'd like to see a, a May close up above 990. We, we actually traded that uh, today, did not close above that. That's, that's not as positive as I'd like to see. But I think we're going to have some chances. The bean market actually has held up pretty well. After a big harvest in the fall, Brazil's uh, harvest is 75, 80% along the way, and beans have been very resilient here, so I think there's going to be some opportunities to sell beans. I just think that you need to have a trigger in place. Our sell signals have been a pretty good one for that. I think you're going to want to wait for that, and, and we'll probably see some of those opportunities next week. All right. So now we'll get into detail on the new crop soybean pricing in our Market Plus segment, which you can find on our website. With that, let's jump right down and talk livestock markets. The, the live cattle trade was relatively stable this week. Brian, does it look like we've got some some solidness here going into springtime I think so uh, you know the choice select cutout values uh, were in a two or three week decline but they've actually reversed higher with no real clear resistance in, in those values maybe up to, to the to the January high of like say 260 futures markets are really trading kind of sideways here up above long-term averages so from a futures market standpoint uh, it looks to me like the market is really primed to go higher. I'd be looking for opportunities to sell above these uh, levels here, and I think that the cutout values are telling us that those opportunities could be coming. Mm. And if you look at the uh, if you look at the outside funds, the f uh, speculative money, we had a real uh, a big shot in the arm with long sided. Uh, positions last week, uh, 9,000 contracts in the live cattle. That's a that's a pretty good. That's the first time in quite some months that we've seen that kind of futures, uh, long-sided futures ownership. And so I think cattle. If you look at June, and then of course if you look at the August, uh, August could surely trade 156 or so. If we close above the 151 area, then I think you could look for 156 and some and, and an opportunity to sell out there. If we trade somewhat down to that moving average, the 20-day moving average in the live cattle, 
uh, it might be a chance to get long there. All right. So now on the feeder cattle side, we didn't see a bump real quick over the next couple weeks. Do you think we're going to come up on these lower corn values? Well, I mean, the, the feeders have, uh, you know, they have a, there's the inventory, the numbers are still small. And feeder cattle still have an, an, an upward bias. The trends are still higher. And I think we want to continue to see, we're going to continue to see feeder cattle uh, make, new, make new highs here nearby. All right. Now, one of the stories that has been interesting to watch and, and tough to follow for a lot of producers is that hog market. Very, very down and sideways. Now it looks like we're trading sideways. Is there good news for the hog market out there, in your opinion? Well, at least we're not talking about new contract lows. <clears throat> Last week, the, the futures market had a daily reversal, which was confirmed on a higher close on Friday. The hogs and pig report was really more of a, of a neutral spring and summer, uh, with the deferreds getting the bullish uh, response on smaller breeding numbers. And so we're seeing that maybe the futures can rally here some more. Uh, I would be looking for selling opportunities in the hog market here, uh, particularly in the June and on into the deferreds where the, where the upside has been. The problem in the hog market is we're well supplied. The numbers are telling us that we have plenty of supply. Uh, the, the port slowdown backed up supplies. Uh, PED inventories did not uh, liquidate as much as we thought. And so the market is well supplied. And if you look at carcass cutout values in pork right now, the only good news is that they're very competitive at the retail level, and hopefully that'll bring us some upside. We'll see some buyers come back to the market. Hopefully. Thanks for joining us this week, Brian. Thank you. That wraps up this edition of Market to Market. But Brian and I will continue our discussion and answer some of your questions in our Market Plus segment online. You'll also find audio podcasts as well as streaming video of our program exclusively at the Market to Market website. And be sure to join us next week when we'll revisit a trio of Kansas brothers whose agricultural video clips have been viewed by millions. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.